listening. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors. The Misfee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Pepper Master. Hot pepper sauces made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning and hello, kids, and welcome to season four and episode number 452 of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryer Media Network. Yeah. Boom. That's my sexy voice. Today, recording day is Wednesday. <laughs> August 21st, 2024. And uh, I'm not sure if it's going to be, it looks like it's going to be a great day here at the Beaver Lodge, but uh, we'll see uh, what the day has in store for us. I'm your host, the eager beaver pronouns he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver A. And with me, as always, is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly. <laughs> Big, big thank you goes to our podcast founding sponsors, The Peppermaster, The Miss Fee Mysteries from Corbin Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. Got a good show for you today, but uh, Mr. Grizzly, before we do anything else, how's your mental health today, sir? Um, I would have to say it's probably better than it has been in the last few days, in all honesty. I uh, did speak to um, a few people yesterday who, who are kind of feeling the same funk and uh, one of my neighbors he was out walking his dog this morning he's like i just can't wake up the last few days i said yeah i said you know the the, the sun rises later so that doesn't help and it's been raining for four days which doesn't help i said oh. and here's the thing that triggered an alarm last night when i was discussing it with bridget mercury is in retrograde she goes oh that shit's real so I started looking at some stuff online, and yeah, it can actually affect people on an emotional, physical level. Yeah, And it's definitely been doing it to me. So there you go. It's been in retrograde since the 5th of August and will re remain so until the 28th. So I'm looking at the forecast, and we're supposed to start to get sunshine and more normal temperatures in Ottawa over the next few days. Because right now it's 14 degrees and drizzly and gray overcast. It's been that way for four days. I'm like, I had a tan. It's gone now. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> uh, we did get some sunshine yesterday, uh, which was nice here. Uh, but yeah, we're, we seem to be back to the regularly scheduled blah. Uh, oh, chin up, though. Next week's forecast, drizzle. Oh, Remember that commercial lovely. from years ago? Uh, <laughs> rain, uh, more rain. And we're looking at next week. Oh, chin up. Next week's forecast, it's downgraded to drizzle. <laughs> Drizzle, 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 drizzle all the day. Drizzle, drizzle, drizzle. <laughs> Is that like dreidel? Yes. Dreidel song? Yes. Okay. You would pay attention. Um, all right. Uh, kids and cubs. Lots, uh, lots to discuss this morning. Um, be before you get rolling, uh, yep, yep. we will address this, this, this um, survey from Canadian and Mental Health Association, Canadian Association of Mental Health Institute, um, because they, they're talking about students in schools who are really suffering right now. We will get to that in just a few minutes. Oh, 
uh, yeah, I do want to discuss this in detail, and I will send you a link to the article, sir. Okay. So you, you'll have something to a little bit of background knowledge on this. I read about this this morning. And I was like, that's so you, good. you were able to tell from my oh that I have not seen that yet this morning. Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, we will get to that in a minute, but before we do, I thought we'd start well, off with something something lighthearted. Um, you, I don't know if you've seen this, but it's it's um, well. Let's just, um, we'll just, just, just enjoy this as much as I did. And it's easy to forget what home and hope look like, especially as you get older, or maybe you move around a lot because of your job. But you didn't pick the Carney life, the Carney life picked you. So let me paint the picture of school children, boys and girls being welcomed by their teacher at the front of the school as they walk in to learn about reading, writing, arithmetic, and our proud history. Before walking in the door though, we look back at dad and his pickup truck. He follows the school bus every day to make sure the kids don't catch the woke. Mom thinks the truck costs too much, but, but dad, he just thinks mom's being hysterical again. You know, crazy with woman stuff. After he drops them off, he rolls down that suburban street with his windows open in the school zone, driving slow questionable slowly so we can hear that beautiful crackling sound of hammers pounding nails into canadian lumber then he starts to doubt himself because crackling doesn't seem like the right word but he listens bang 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 slowly then he wonders if anyone else can hear it or is it just the sound of his heart or his truck but one thing for sure he could nail the hell out of a good looking two by four right now he makes his way out into the countryside where he's going to go and service a well. And well, sure, that could be a Freudian slip, but let's not focus on that. And he looks up, and what does he see? A brand new fighter jet. They're doing a training mission. And where are they doing it? In the sky, like men, getting ready to defend our home and native land. The same plane is soon seen from a university campus where kids are hustling off to class. Maybe a bit late, having just procrastinated on that university essay. Maybe they're out late. Maybe they're having a good time with friends. Maybe hammering wood. But knowing that when they get to class, they will have the chance to debate freely and fearlessly without worry of being censored by the woke wood Gestapo. Later in the day, that whole family of the students, that welder, at least I think that's what you call guys who service wells, the kids, moms and dads come together for a big family celebration because it's been years since one of the adult kids in the family has been sober and overcome his drug addiction and if you can't beat him join him so <laughs> another oaky chardonnay and they gather around the table to have a big beautiful dinner to celebrate some wonderful venison that was shot with totally legal canadian firearms i'm not Wait. sure why i said totally like that as little ones conk off and it's time to take them home, grandma and grandpa see them off to the car. And the car leaves the driveway and they turn and they look west. And what do they see? They see wheat, foothills, <laughs> Rockies, and a big blue twilight sky. And they look each other in the eye and they say, we're home. And the kids resign themselves to another night in the backseat of the car in the middle of a field. These are our people. That is our country. This is our home, your home. My home, our home, Home Alone 2 was pretty good, almost as good as the original. Let's get takeaway. Maybe skip the dishes or DoorDash, whichever one has a coupon code. But let's bring it home. <laughs> Thought I'd start off with that. <laughs> oh my God. Before we get into the series. I love that, man. <laughs> Oh, it's, it's pretty brilliant. Brittle star. Oh my god, that's perfect. Uh, and for the 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 kids who are are, are listening at home, uh, if you heard me uh, guffaw a couple of times, is uh, the, the 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 cattle grazing the fields or elephants. Elephants in the <laughs> on the Syrian African plane on the or an, or an African lion safari or one of the other. I'm not sure. <laughs> oh my Looked God. like the Serengeti to me. <laughs> and then there was another one I can't remember off the top of my head, but oh my God, it got me. Oh, jeez. Oh God, I love that man. Oh, that's yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, uh, I thought it was a good way to start because we're going to talk about some serious subject matter. 
today yeah. pardon me. Uh, and we have something else from our, our friend jake or your old pal jake we got some stuff we'll look at from him a little bit later on but i did yes. want to get to this article um it's uh global news uh hannah alberga by hannah alberga from the canadian press actually uh this was posted uh, at 319 this morning updated uh, at 320. <laughs> okay there is a video but i'm not going to share the video it's just uh, many students are struggling with mental health concerns in Ontario, and they rate their ability to cope with these challenges as only fair or poor. The most recent survey, which has been conducted every two years since 1977, this is news to me, I didn't know this, to gauge Ontario students' health and drug use, shows a third of students said they needed mental health support from a professional but never sought the help. Some said they thought they could manage the problems themselves, while others worried that what others would think or were just too busy. So that line, what others were, while others worried what others would think or were just too busy, that describes me in high school to a T. And we didn't talk about mental health in the 80s. It was not something we discussed. It says, we know the mental health is worse for young people right now than it's ever been, but I think to actually see the numbers, it's pretty jarring. And it is. It's very concerning. While the vast majority of surveyed students said they use social media daily and 78% reported spending three hours or more per day in front of the screen, it's just there's not enough data to conclude that time spent online has caused the increased levels of distress. For 17-year-old Olivia Toker, Toker? Tocher, T-O-C-H-E-R, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Climate change, job uncertainty, and the high cost of living are among the stressors that led the teen to seek help for anxiety and depression at the Canadian Association of Mental Health. We just, our generation is growing up in a world where we're constantly told our future is scary, she told a youth advisor. The survey found that about 18% of students are very or extremely worried about climate change, while 45% that said the issue makes them feel depressed about the future. We need a future to look forward to. We are capable, but we still need support. The latest survey did show some positive developments, highlighting a significant decline in youth drug use over several decades and a steady decline in alcohol use over the past 25 years, which mm -hmm. if anybody who knows anything about anything right now, that is not a surprise. That's no. been well documented for the last yeah. number of years. And other things too. I mean, kids are delaying having sex for so yes. the first time and all that kind of stuff too, all these things, so these behaviors are changing. changing. Yes, and it's changing for the positive, but they're still being faced with, you know, all these other issues. 17% mm -hmm. yep. of students reported using, using cannabis in the past year, a number that has decreased, decreased since 2019, according to data that also showed a decline in vaping. But for the first time, female students are using cannabis, vaping, and drinking more than male students. Oh. Yeah. While more research is needed to understand this trend, may speak to increased pressure specifically for girls, said Dr. Leslie Buckley, head of the Addictions Division at uh, Canadian Association for Mental Health. So, yeah, lots to unpack in that. Um, I, like I said, you know, when I was in high school, I knew there was something wrong with me, but I didn't know what it was. And... Uh, waking up every day being physically exhausted um self-loathing the, the the feelings of of despair and uh, just i went through that for years and i didn't know what was wrong with me i finally got a diagnosis in the 90s and i tried to talk about it and at the time well the the, the climate was not welcoming to that discussion we'll leave it at that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so i didn't talk about it again until you know many years later now i talk about it when I need to and for those folks who have said to me when did you change I'm like I never changed I was always this way I just kept it hidden from you so if you see me differently now the only one who's changed is you not me and I borrowed that line from great Canadian comedian LV Recurt mm -hmm, mm -hmm. indeed indeed I like her very much yeah I've um, her a few times on on the Twitter and, and she's a uh, interacted with me she's a lovely person but yeah that was her comment because the first time i saw her do a live show on i think it was comedy now or one of those channels i don't know she uh, was about 30 minutes into her, her 60 minute set when she uh, reveals that she's a lesbian on in the, on the program and she says oh and i see some shocked faces in the audience see here's the thing 
<laughs> always been this way yeah. you just found out about it now and if you see me differently the only one that's changed is you not me and I'm, i've kept that forever i said you know i've been like this for long as you've known me there's only you know a few people who've known me longer uh who who, who knew me before the mental health issues yeah but we were children so yeah. you know kid tim goes here you changed what you showed people and that's that's it yeah uh, yeah but you haven't changed yep i agree i agree um for those who are wondering uh this particular study uh, was a survey of more than ten thousand students in grades seven to ten um there was data collected from 235 schools across ontario between november 2022 and june 2023 and it showed that 19 percent of surveyed students engaged in self-harm and 18 percent had serious thoughts about suicide in the previous year yeah that's, as well that's really disturbing yeah that is very disturbing um uh, kit uh, trent has a good comment here yeah i just posted that a second ago yeah uh, so uh for uh, reading it for our audience that are listening on audio uh bullying was at school uh as a kid but now it's online and follows you everywhere and that's true yes and it's not just limited to kids anymore. No, no. Everybody's being bullied now. Adults, senior citizens, it, it doesn't matter. Well, and, and something that doesn't, I mean, it's, we're going to go a little off topic here, sort of. Mm -hmm. um, bullying in the workplace is something that's long been going on, right? It's been happening for a long time. Well, now they can cyber bully you too. So, you know, when you, when, when you were a kid, when we were children, when we were in high school, when you got on that bus to go home, that was behind you. Now it follows you everywhere. Well, some people, it follows them to work. Oh yeah. And when they leave work, they're still bringing it home because they might have a, see what I did there? They're still bringing it home. Because mm -hmm. they might, sorry. That I, I didn't know if you caught it or not. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I have to point it out just because my subtlety is a little bit too much for some folks, but, um, they're still bringing it home and, and you will have folks who will cyber bully you online through the workplace. Mm -hmm. Right. So, happened, it happened to me recently. Actually, I was, uh, on our, um, on our Facebook feed, there was, uh, someone who was, uh, through the, you know, not following the house rules on the comment section and, uh, you know, give a first warning, you know, says the, you know please read our about section. You know, mm -hmm. we have our rules, right? We treat each other with respect. We don't first assume the worst of each other. You know, uh, if there's something that somebody said that you could be taken one or two ways rather than assuming what it is, ask, uh, I didn't understand that. What did you mean by that? Right? Let's have it. It's a question. Well, let's, let's find that question right? rather than filling in the blanks. You know, uh, we all assume that we're of good intent, even if we have different views um, or different takes on things. Uh, and that person wasn't doing that. And uh, at one point, uh, I took it offline to do that and then i got uh this type of message it's like it's like you know these emails uh, these emails and messages will never stop they'll keep continuing it's like you know it's sort of like and it's like um block mm -hmm. <laughs> right i mean again face oh really okay well here's my unbothered me living my best life i'll just uh block you and never heard from this person again so this person was like talking to me like you know i'm going to be here every day putting this stuff in your face in order if you don't it's like block <laughs> uh, okay if that's what you want to do with your life i tend to um, mute more people than anything else so that they keep screaming into the wind and I just well yes yeah i prefer mute yes I do. but for most things it's mute yes oh yeah i guess but if you get a stage five clinger mm -hmm. Right. That at one point, you know, it's like you write one thing, you say, okay, that's it. And then you turn it on mute and then you see like seven gray boxes appear. It's like, okay, clearly you're, you're writing, you're, you're writing the coattails in my feed to try. Then I will block depending on the certain content. You know, if mm -hmm. somebody comes in, like happened uh, on our feed the, the other day saying that, you know, stuff like uh, Germany was only democratic between 1933 and 1940. Um, no, you gotta you, go. You gotta go. So, um, you know, there, there are certain lines, but for the most part, I mean, if, if you're just going to be annoying, an annoying pest, mm -hmm. mute. Yeah. Like, that's that's, easiest thing. And then let's see how long you scream into a wind tunnel before you get tired <laughs> because you're not getting an answer. Um, because there are some people like that online, right? 
It's it's not about they, they sit there and they annoy you like this, and they want you to block them. So then they go, "Ha ha, I win," mm-hmm. and it's like, "Okay, you were so annoying that somebody decided that they didn't want to hear from you anymore." If you consider that a victory, then if that's what you got going on in your life and that's what you need to get through your day to win, I'm happy to give it to you. I mean, who am I to deny you? But I mean, seriously, if you think that making yourself so unpleasant that people don't want to talk to you and therefore reduce your reach is a win. Mm-hmm. Well, 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 we have different ways of seeing the world. <laughs> I can't, I, I ain't got nothing for you. Here's your win. I, I, I'm just not that invested. <laughs> right? I'm not going to sit there and go, no, I refuse to block you so you don't have a win and then keep on having you show up like 75 times a day on my feed. It's like, if you want to win, I'm happy to help you win. It's, I lose nothing. Mm-hmm. You winning makes me lose nothing. If me blocking you is a win for you, I don't lose. I, hey, if we both win, I'm good with that. So, <laughs> so yeah, there's there's this mentality i think that uh on that section certain people on that side of the spectrum it's like haha see i they're intolerant and they never listen and it's, well, i was willing to listen i engaged you but you were just unpleasant mm-hmm. i mean you can have different views you can have i had a different view with a, a farmer about the rail track rail strike who are saying, you know, like government come in and like, you know, impose mediation. And it's like, well, no, what, what about like the workers? It's like, yeah, but I'm going to suffer too. Well, of course, farmers are going to yeah. suffer too. We all will. And farmers are definitely not paid what they're worth as well. No. But as I'm sitting there, like, wouldn't be, wouldn't it be smarter to stand with the workers mm-hmm. like this? And then when farmers ask for something, the workers will stand with you. It's two different ways of seeing the world. There's not one that's not one that's right or wrong because the farmer is speaking for their interests. Yes. Their collateral damage in this one. Mm -hmm. So we both had points. I could see their point. They could see mine. But they still would prefer that the government come in right now and say, no, we're going immediately to, to mediation. And I'm saying, you know what? This... With this particular government, there's a pattern of letting things happen. It usually doesn't happen for more than two weeks before the government then decides to, okay, maybe we, we will start putting in some pressure, but they give some space. And the deals that we have had have been better for the workers. So, you know, now, of course, I'm not personally suffering as much as a farmer in this case. So, I mean, I am sitting from, you know, urban dweller who earns my living in a different way I am going to be way less inconvenienced by this rail truck than an actual farmer at this particular time of the year who needs to get stuff shipped. Clearly. Clearly. So, you know, I have the luxury of saying, more of the luxury of saying, hey, let it play out than maybe someone else. Right? So... But we could, we were both able to understand each other's perspective. There was no yelling. There was no swearing. There was no name calling. There was no, I can't believe you think that. Don't you, you know, it's like, are you uncaring about the workers? Like, no. Because, but they care about their own business and feeding their own family. Which I understand. <laughs> right? So, uh, you know, and my thing was sort of like, well, you know, it's like, my, my personal view is you stand with the workers and if there's uh, extensive damage, then as farmers, you get together and you demand some type of compensation from the government. Right? Like, let's find another way out, but let the workers have theirs and try to find another solution. And, you know, if something went on for a long time, I'm pretty sure the federal government would come in with some type of compensation because, I mean, it's not in the federal government's interest either to have farmers, you know, be in a bad position as collateral damage. So... But you can have these discuss. It is possible to have these discussions without first assuming the worst for some, someone, assuming that they're uncaring because they have a different point of view and that type of stuff. But it all depends on how you approach each other, how you enter each other's space. Mm-hmm. 
right? If the first thing you say when you enter someone's space is, I can't believe you must be a heartless cold. Well, what do you think you're going to get? Well, of course. Right? So <laughs> when you come, you got to come correct. You catch right? most as with honey, but I think you catch the most with dead squirrels. It was, just a, <laughs> that was from Cheers, actually. Oh. That was a, woody, a Woodyism from Cheers. You catch more flies with honey. Actually, uh, Mr. Peterson, you, you, I think you catch the most with dead squirrels. <laughs> well, logic's not assailable. <laughs> I don't know if you catch them, but you attract them. And if you attract mm -hmm. them, you have better chances of catching them. Uh, well, so one, yes. of, uh, one of the big concerns I have with the mental health issue with, with um, school age children, teenagers, yep. uh, you know, young children, is, is that they are not getting the help that they need. Because what has Doug Ford done here in the province of Ontario? Cut the education budget. He's got $21 billion from the health care budget over the next five years. I don't know, I can't remember how many billion he cut to the education budget, but what is he trying to do? He's trying to privatize education by going for charter schools. And all that does is destroy our public education and give elite children an elite opportunity, which by the way, private schools already do exist in Ontario. Mm -hmm. They have for, oh, a century, if not more, yep. for the wealthy. We have one here in Ottawa that's well known, and and it's not the Montessori, which is also another private school, but but Montessori is a slightly different approach. But there's one here in Rockcliffe Park, and Ashbury College. It's a uh, elementary through high school, and I know yeah. a number of people have gone there. I think the other one's Elmwood. You're thinking of Elmwood. Yes, yeah, is the other one. Thank you. They do exist. They have for a long time, but those are not funded with public money. Charter schools are funded with public cash. So why am I paying for a private school? Because Ashbury College and Elmwood are paid for by the parents of the students. They don't get public funds like any other public school would because they're private. So these charter schools are publicly funded, public-private partnership, if you want to call it. And that's just more money going towards the elite, the wealthy the trickle down economy that as we all know has never ever worked ever so who does this harm well it harms us it harms our children our nieces nephews it harms our future because we're raising a generation of kids that think the world is going to end because well we've done nothing to fix or solve or repair it because the wealthy and powerful elite will continue to pollute this world and destroy the climate all for the sake of a few bucks and we have political leaders and a political party in this country who have denied that climate change is real. When Pierre Polyev was, well, I don't want to use the term elected leader because it may be suspect about how he got in. Stuffing ballot boxes, et cetera, et cetera. Support from another nation, which by the way, as it turns out, anybody can join the conservative party. And it looks like a lot of people from South Asian continent did, but that's another story for a different day. But really, you have a party, a political party in this country whose, mo whose delegates largely agreed that climate change is not real. Yeah. But I can tell you something. When I was in Alberta, I had a lot of people I had discussions with and a lot of them very much know that climate change is real because there are farmers or work in the Rockies where they very much require snow for people in the wintertime. Sure, the Banff is busy year round, but this past winter, everybody lost money because there simply wasn't enough snow. They didn't have a long enough season. People who work in an industry where the climate directly impacts your livelihood will tell you climate change is very real. Mm. So when you have a generation of kids in school who that is one of their biggest concerns and they're not getting the mental health support they need because what has our premier done but cut billions of dollars from the education and healthcare budgets? 
So not only does the healthcare support that they need in schools not exist because they've cut the healthcare budget, but they've also cut the school budget. So even if the healthcare budget was cut, they don't have the budget. <laughs> like, he's cutting off our noses to spite our faces. And like you discussed yesterday, he was all against green energy. But now that his wealthy donor buddies are in on green energy, he's all in on green energy. More public money for private contractors to pad their bank accounts and wallets. Mm. Suffers in the end? We do. But yeah. do we suffer for green energy? Okay, so maybe he's moved in the right direction, but he's doing it for the wrong reason. Not yeah. because he's altruistic and he wants to do this to help the country and the planet. He's doing this because he's motivated by cash. And that's it. So what we have to do is find a way to look like we're monetizing mental health. Maybe we sell beer. That's it. We sell beer and cannabis with, with mental health consultants when they go into high schools. And that's how Doug will fund it. Because I mm. just, I just, <laughs> I don't know how to tell this man because he refuses to listen. And I, I don't want to be angry about it anymore. I am, I am, I'm very upset. I'm very moved and motivated by this, but I don't want to be angry about it anymore. It's like, Doug, help the children, man. Put money back into our public health care and our public education system and stop handing it over to your private contractor buddies. Stop. Apparently he's going to call an early election. Oh, so Ontario, Ontario, get out and vote. Absolutely. Uh, now the kits and cubs here are um, in the chat um, sharing um, some stories, some good sharing about uh, instances of them having been bullied um, when they were younger and stuff. So um, thank you uh, for all the sharing and uh, thank you for every, everyone for uh, being uh, respectful and uh, thank you Kit Trent for uh, bringing up the subject uh, and opening that door for people to share that way. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm, I'm glad that, that people walked through it. Um, when you talk about, um, Doug Ford preparing for an election, um, we got a very clear, clear, clear sign of it yesterday, um, presented under the guise of helping people get into treatment. Uh, the Ontario government made some announcements yesterday, uh, with regard to harm reduction and uh, safe injection sites, mm -hmm. um, they uh, announced a new plan to address the opioid crisis in the province by announcing it will shut down more than half of its supervised drug consumption sites uh, under the pretext uh, that uh, they are the ones that they are closing are too close to schools and daycare centers and all that kind of stuff. I am guessing that these are not uh, centers uh, that were close to day uh, cares and schools prior to recently since uh, child care uh, programs have come up, but that there are child care centers that have set up closer to them. And I do not know off the top of my head uh, if they uh, increased the range because now uh, they are banning consumption sites within 200 meters of a school or a daycare. I'm not sure if uh, that rule was 100 meters before or something, which actually brings more of them into uh, the fold. So uh, I don't know if there were changes like that. I'd have to read more on the sort. Uh, but yes, uh, they're saying that they will close it and that the money instead will go towards treatment. Officials say they, quote, hope to break the cycle of a crisis that's killing roughly 200 Ontarians a month. But others are saying the plan will only lead to more unnecessary deaths. Um, there are uh, parents of people who have died of overdoses who are saying that a supervised consumption sent site where they could have tested their drugs could have saved their lives. Uh, so there are people who've lost children who are protesting uh, this decision. Um, but uh, Sylvia Jones, alleged health minister, or alleged. more like health monster of Ontario, said 
Quote, the cycle of addiction is not being broken by using drug consumption sites. It's not supposed to, Minister Jones. It's never meant to. That's not the idea. This is the same thing as people going, you know, COVID, the COVID vaccine. The COVID vaccines didn't prevent, didn't stop the illness from transmitting. It's like, that's to keep you not alive. what the vaccine was supposed to do. The vaccine is supposed to help you build your immune system so that if ever you do contract it, it's, they're your personal risk of severe illness and death are significantly reduced. That is what the vaccine did. Nobody who knows anything about science promised anybody this vaccine will completely stop transmission. Now, a few people are getting sick. Of course, transmission is curtailed, but it doesn't prevent, it doesn't totally annihilate. It doesn't annihilate transmission any more than a murder law stops murder. Yes. 100%. It's a deterrent. It provokes a lot of people to think twice and not do it because they like their freedom and it's not worth it <laughs> to go to jail, but people still murder anyway. So just as everybody says, oh, well, this law didn't work, let's get rid of it. You, know, you could say, well, murder laws don't work, so let's get rid of them too. Right? Nothing is a 100% solution. Same thing with supervised consumption sites. Their goal is not to break the cycle of addiction. It's a secondary goal. Mm -hmm. If you go there and you go there often enough and you build a relationship of trust with some people and you get to a point of your life where you turn around and you say, hey, I want to make a change. The people are there to help you, to direct you to the services you need, assuming those services are there mm -hmm. for you to be sent to when you're actually ready. But the goal of a supervised consumption site is harm reduction. Not addiction prevention. Term Not addiction, addiction. Keep you alive. Cessation. To keep you alive long enough yes, so that when you hit the point when you say, you know what, I need to make a change, you're alive to make that change. Well, this That's from, the goal. From our so, friend Dan, Toronto Dan. I'm alive because of harm reduction. And now I'm running for city council. I dare Ford to tell me harm reduction doesn't work. He's just an asshole who needs to be brought back to reality. Well, I agree with you. Yeah. So when you're, this debate keeps on being presented as harm reduction or treatment by the conservative side. And it's harm reduction and treatment. It's all the things. Mm -hmm. yes. We do need more treatment because there are a lot of people that turn around and say, we're ready for treatment. Well, sorry, we don't have a bed or we don't have a program for you. Because so you don't you don't get any treatment. Need to be there when people are ready, and you have to keep the people alive long enough to actually make the decision to want to go. Because forced treatment usually does not work. Exactly. So this means these new rules means that ten of the seventeen sites in the province will close by March thirty first next year. It's also banning any new supervised consumption sites from opening. They say, we need to do more to support a journey into treatment and recovery. So the government's putting $378 million into treatment hubs, and those hubs will provide mental health and addiction services, hundreds of supporting housing units, and stuff of the like, which is very important. We do need those things. But again, we do not need those things at the expense of or in lieu of mm -hmm. safe consumption sites. We need them in addition to these safe consumption sites. I, if you don't have a place that people are going to go to, and we know that addicts will do what addicts will do anyway, because once you have an addiction, it has a hold on you. You are not in control. No, you're not. And again, you might be in control, as Matthew Perry told us, mm -hmm. of your first use when you're an addict. Might. 
Might. Because you might not be, because there might have been, depending on how long you've been an addict, there might have been changes to your brain chemistry. There might be changes to your your physiology that makes it such that your body craves it. And no matter how much you personally would like to will yourself well, and, to and not it, like this. The, they discovered recently, well, how recently I couldn't tell you, but they've recently discovered that some people's DNA is wired to be an addict, period. It's in your genetic code to be addicted to drugs or alcohol or gambling or something. And you can't just decide to change. You need a lot of help, a lot of counseling, and you need harm reduction to begin with. Yeah. So um, advocates like Diana Chan McNally are saying, while treatment is crucial, so are consumption sites, quote, you're going to see more drug use outside and you're going to see a higher incidence of overdose. Because mm -hmm. if, you you if you reduce those sites... So again, it seems to be one of those things, you know, when I mentioned on Laura's show that uh, we are profit centers, mm -hmm. well, addicts, if we're, if we're talking, I'm not saying this personally, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. Because like people will clip things at uh, yes. specific spots. Because if you're looking at people as profit centers, then addicts are a drag. Mm -hmm. They cost you. Mm -hmm. But all they do is they look at what addicts are costing now. They don't look at that addict who might be 26 years old, let's say. All the money that you invested in that person as a child in education, in health, in providing community supports. If we're talking strictly financial, you're going to let all of that investment just go mm -hmm. because they be, there happen to be an addict now. If you can actually keep them alive to, until a moment, like Adana said, right? He was kept alive. Look yes. at him now. Mm -hmm. If he actually does get elected, he will have a salary. Yes. His salary is going to go up substantially. His quality of life will go up substantially. The amount of taxes he will pay will go up substantially. The amount of disposable cash that he will have to spend and stimulate the economy will go up. Someone can be an addict for X number of years, come out on the other side, still have a long, healthy, productive life. And over the course of their life, they will have been a net contributor. Again, if we are looking people strictly as profit centers, Mm -hmm. because that's what Doug likes to do over the course of the entire life. Yes. If you're going to look at them just as their five years or six years where they are at the, you know, the worst part of their lives or the most challenging part of their lives, well, of course, then you, you write them off. Mm -hmm. A person has mm -hmm. value and can contribute their entire life long. If you give up at them when they're 26 because they're costing you too much now, that's a lot of, lot of investment in someone that you're just throwing away, and that's a lot of future opportunity that you are just passing up on. It's not worth to fight for. You're, you're, telling, you're telling people they're not worth fighting for. Yes. Why would you ever tell someone who has an addiction that they're not worth fighting for? How do you think that's going to help? How does that help? It doesn't. Never no, has, never will. People who have never used drugs or have never been an addict, and Dan can tell you, or have never been homeless, don't realize that even though they're not communities that we would want to live in, mm -hmm. there is a sense of community. There is a culture in that community, for a lot of us, it is foreign. How many of us watching actually take time to stop and have a conversation with someone who's homeless? Well, let, let's, let's remember something here. I, I actually do frequently, but let's remember something here. Uh, but it's not that, a common thing. Pardon? It's not a common thing. No, no. Like a no. real conversation? Yes, I do frequently. Yeah, I know, but I'm talking the average person. Oh, no, no, We're no. We're busy. We're busy. 
and don't can't be bothered and we got our own stuff to deal with and i understand that i understand that but let, let's go back uh, to to uh, march or april of 2020 when everything was shutting down and we were asked to stay home to protect each other the cannabis stores and the liquor stores were kept open why safe supply simple as that because what happens to a chronic alcoholic if suddenly they can't get alcohol they will die and the hospitals were already overrun with covid patients they didn't need more added to it so what did doug do he made sure the safe supply stayed online and if you think at the lcbo and the beer store is not a safe supply of a of a controlled substance you've got some learning to do because alcohol is a drug yeah. nicotine is a drug caffeine is a drug and they all affect everybody differently some people don't partake in any of them good for you good for you you're able to cope with the ills of the world without any sort of crutch i salute you mm -hmm. some days not often i enjoy i enjoy a beer i enjoy a glass of wine I enjoy whiskey. Some days I need a drink. Sometimes that happens because all the other tools I have in my toolbox are not working. So I'll go and have a beer and I'll try and forget about life for a little while. Is that, the, is, it, is it a good thing to do? Probably not. But if it gets me through to the next day, isn't that what's important? Because I have a safe supply, I can get through to the next day when I'm really struggling, which is all sites are about. Safe consumption sites are all about keeping people alive for one more day. And then the next day we can get them the help they need. Yeah. Yeah. I have a clip here from an ER doctor. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let him uh, pronounce his name because if I try to, I'm going to screw it up. He's here in Ontario and he's discussing what just took place. It's a two-minute clip and I want to share it with everybody. So have a look at this. Hi, it's Dr. Reku Fanukapal uh, giving feedback to the Deputy Premier on this important announcement that she made. And while I do welcome her announcement, because we need more support for those who are homeless, and we need more support for those with addictions seeking treatment because right now 98 percent of the phone calls we make are a waste of time for the patient because there is no bed so i welcome that announcement but the question for the deputy premier is where will the overdoses go if the many hundreds and thousands of people across canada who are overdosing and being treated at our harm reduction sites um, can't use there anymore who will attend to them deputy premier when they overdose on the street in the baseball diamond or in the park the reality is is that our already stretched paramedics will be responding when bystanders call when someone is blue and not breathing and those same ambulance crews will be pulled off the calls they can make for other people and they will bring them to me in the emergency department and they will receive a stretcher because they're very sick and they will displace someone else with another medical problem unrelated to addictions that needs that stretcher as well. And I'm not making this up in my head. This is what happened last night, even up till 3 a.m. when I was on duty, when I couldn't find a stretcher for the ill and injured people that needed one. So if we're not going to attend to people with their overdoses in safe use sites, where are they going to go? It's simply not enough to have three legs to the table. We need the fourth leg of good addictions policy, which is harm reduction. We agree on law enforcement. We agree on treatment. We agree on prevention, but we also need harm reduction and that's good policy. And where, Deputy Premier, are the overdoses going to go? I said it so much more eloquently than I could. Well, he's an ER doctor. I just gave yeah. him a follow, and I will, uh, let me share that clip with you uh, so you can uh, perhaps reach out and see if he'd like to join us on the yes. show sometime. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so here's the thing. So Sylvia Jones made the announcement. Speaking to, this is from CTV. Speaking to reporters Tuesday via Zoom, Somerset West Community Health Center Executive Director Susan 
Obiora said this new policy came as a surprise. Quote, we have not had any opportunity to engage with the provincial government prior to this message, she said. However, we are gravely concerned that the decision to defund and close consumption and treatment services will have a devastating consequence for our community. Other speakers at the virtual news conference, because she did this virtually, Tuesday added they were not consulted or informed on the decision. Rob Boyd, CEO of Ottawa Inner City Health, said he was gutted by the news, also said his organization was not consulted. Quote, we were not asked our opinions on what needed to happen. We are experts in the field of harm reduction, but also experts in the field of treatment, and we are also experts in the field of community safety and community health. Sandy Hill Community South Center CEO Robin McAndrew said she was blindsided. Quote, we first heard about this from the media and not from our government partners. The community health leaders echoed the risk that closing the Somerset West consumption and treatment site would pose. Quote, we are deeply concerned with the ministry decision that will have significant implications for our services and the people we serve. This will disproportionately affect members of our community who experience the greatest vulnerability and marginalization. This decision will not address the root cause of why people find themselves using substances. Rather, it will lend itself to people using alone, using unsafely, and putting them at increased risk of harm and death. Now, um, government says that they want to put more treatment hubs in. They have experts not only in harm reduction but in treatment. And they make this decision quickly Fastly, with no consult consultation with them. And, gee, look at all the crime. Residents of near Ottawa's sites are concerned about the drug-related crimes in their community, Jones said. We need to do more to support a journey into treatment and recovery to keep communities safe and to address the tragic impact of substance use, drug overdoses, and opiate-related deaths in our communities. Sounds a bit like pee-pee, doesn't it? Sounds a lot like, hey, there's an election coming, and we need a red meat issue that we can go to the electorate. I'm yes, going because... to keep your community safe from crime, safe from those, those addicts that you do not like seeing. Hey, we're not going to give them a place to shoot up anymore. Now, we could have taken some time to develop this policy with all these treatment people to make sure that everything was okay. But hey, TikTok, we got an election coming. That's exactly what they're so we doing. Want, we're going to run on this. So they're ready. literally taking addicts and they are throwing them in the trash for the purpose of generating an election issue because look at those liberals and look at those NDP people who don't care about the value of your home or about your kids stumbling upon an attic or finding a needle or not. These heartless. Well, Just Ford is not going to go as far as Pierre Polyev saying that, you know, heartless people that are trying to get your kids hooked on crack. He's probably not going to go that far, but he doesn't have to go that far. No, no. But let, let's remember how well this conservative approach to this has worked in other parts of the world. Oh, right. It's never freaking worked. Yep. Now, the 2023 crime trend report for the entire Somerset Ward showed a 2.1% increase in, report, in reported crime, but a 6.2% drop in reported violent crime. So an increase in petty crime, but a three times, almost threefold decrease in violent crime, a 3.3% increase in nonviolent crime worldwide. Total crimes against person were down 6.2% from 921 offenses in 2022 to 847 in 2023. Controlled drug and substance access offenses rose 19% overall, though, in 2023 compared to 2022, going from 42 offenses to 50. So for eight more offenses under the controlled drug and substance access per year, per year, Mm -hmm. yes. even though total crimes are down right. by more than eight, yes, they are going to punish people. Like this. So the crime rate that they're saying is going up isn't. The violent crime rate. Now this is all started because someone got shot. Mm -hmm. Near treatment center, oh my God. And they never let a crisis go to waste. So they're using this as a pretext to do this, saying people are concerned about crime, but the statistics show the crime, particularly violent crime, is going down. The petty crime is going up. Well, the petty crime often 
are crimes of despair. Because people don't have the money they need to get what they need. And what do they do? And also... Particularly if you're an addict, again, if your mm -hmm. body is demanding it, Mm -hmm. you're not thinking about right or wrong. You're thinking about, I am uncomfortable. I'm in pain. Something's wrong. Something that's not functioning. I need to fix this. And how I fix this is getting my next hit. And something else, too, that needs to be considered because it does happen in this city because I've spoken to police officers about this. They have habitual repeat offenders, for want of a better term, who literally are are, are looking for three hots and a cot Mm -hmm. because they just want to get off the street for a night. If it's either too hot in the summer or too cold in the winter, they will do something to get themselves arrested so that they can have a warm place to sleep and three meals. Now, another thing that they're doing is that this 200 a meter law, mm-hmm. I guess it depends how you're measuring 200 meters, right? Mm-hmm. Are you measuring 200 meters by the distance it takes you to walk there? Or are you measuring it at bird's flight? Yeah, like a straight line. Because yeah. if you're measuring as a bird flight, then all of a sudden a whole bunch of other things that weren't included in the zone before get included. I do not know if that was a change. None of the articles say if the way of measuring distance or if the distance has been changed in this policy so far from what I can tell. Now, the treatment hubs that they're talking about, Jones said that there will be nine publicly funded sites that, nine, the nine publicly funded sites that are being closed, so there's 10 in all here, it says nine, so I'm, I'm hearing different numbers, uh, will be given the opportunity to transition to the newly announced homeless and addiction recovery treatment, heart hubs. The government is spending $378 million to establish 19 heart hubs in the province. This is good. right? These sites will provide mental health services, addiction care and support, social services and employment support, shelter and transition beds, supportive housing, and other supplies and services, including naloxone, on-site showers, and food, but will not provide a safer supply of drugs. That wasn't a thing in Ontario anyway, because they decided they weren't going to join that. So there's no change there, in other words and will not provide supervised consumption services or needle exchange programs. So when they are told, hey, service places where you offer this, you can transition to nearly where you can't do what you're doing. If they were going to, so you're not transitioning, you're closing down and offering a whole other service. If you can transition your service from where you are, into these hard hubs, if these hard hubs actually did have a place for safe consumption within it, that would be one thing. Mm-hmm. And all of these were located at a distance of not 200 from a, from a, a, a licensed daycare or school. That would be one thing. But you're using the words, oh, all of you can just transition over here. But the service that you provide is can't come along with you. That's not a transition. So they're in their speech, they're creating the illusion. Someone says, oh no, they're just being moved from here to here, but they're being moved here to here to do a completely different thing. A thing that is needed at the expense of another thing that is needed. As the gentleman said, a table with three legs rather than four. Quote, I'm extremely worried that we will further marginalize a segment of the population that deserves dignified care that meets them where they are at. I've come to understand that the HART model does not allow for harm reduction services. We understand that we can't force people into treatment and that we require a broad range of services and interventions to best support members in our community. And we'll be very curious to see how the heart hubs will offer that spectrum of supports that our community needs and deserves. Now, this supervised consumption service center, the Somerset West Community Health Center, has been in operation since 2018. So, People have known that there's this place that they can go for six years and it's going to just be pulled out right from under them. And again, what's, what's one of the worst things that you can do to an addict? Remove stability. Mm-hmm. Whatever little tiny bit of stability that they have managed to create for themselves in the course of their addiction. Just pull that out right out from under them and leave them with nothing. And all these heart centers going to be built and operational by March 31st? 
Of course not. Like this, was there going to be a gap somewhere on where do they go in the in that meantime? And this is the other thing that makes me think that this is going to be an election thing because before the announcement, Doug Ford, quote, I'll be very frank. I'm not sold on these safe injection sites that are in neighborhoods and needles are all flowing around. It's a haven for drug dealers. Let's get these people to support the need and build more detox beds. And I know our ministers will be making announcements shortly regarding that. Doug Ford said this on August 9th. Premier Doug Ford. I personally, speaking for me, don't give a fuck about whether you personally are convinced or sold about these safe injection sites. This has been to court several times. Our su- Supreme Courts have ruled that addicts have a constitutional right to this type of service. Courts have ruled that addicts should not have to die from their addiction. Every single piece of scientific data in existence shows that this is a net benefit. You do not need to be sold. You just need to do your job, look at the data, and make a data-based decision. You don't have to like what the data says. Sounds like a lot of work for Doug, though. You don't have to like what the data says. You just have to understand and act on it. If you are ideologically opposed to something, but yet every single piece of evidence that is available to you shows that it works, if your job is to serve the people, you put your personal view aside and you do what the data says. It's the same, pe- same, it's the same principle for people who personally, in their personal lives, would never get an abortion for themselves. Mm-hmm. Unless it was really, really, really medically necessary. I guess, and are deeply religious, but who still understand, for example, like Prime Minister Kretze, that when you walk through that door and start your day as the Prime Minister of Canada, your job is to not only represent Catholics who share the same view as you, but all Canadians. That's right. Regardless of religion, regardless of morality, regardless of whatnot, and your job is to keep them safe, and your job is to keep them protected, And if you have the choice of having a service that prevents a woman who is having an ectopic pregnancy from dying, Mm -hmm. someone who already might have a family, thus leaving those children without a parent, somebody who might want more children one day, there's just something medically that happens that they can't have this one. If you're going to do like they do in the States now, when someone has a pregnancy and they're being told, this child is not viable, but I'm sorry, we can't do anything. We have to wait until you develop a severe, severe, severe case of sepsis before we can do anything. We have to wait until your life. So when you're going to be going to the hospital, you're not going to be focused on what's going on, just needing to get this service. But you're going to be running to the hospital now, hoping you come out alive. Mm -hmm. Not just concern for the child you're carrying. A child that you maybe even wanted. You make the decision that protects the most people. That makes it less likely that someone's going to die. That puts the person at less risk. That causes the person the least amount of worry and fear. Regardless of what you personally believe, that's the choice you make. It's real simple. It's not rocket surgery. 
So if on August 9th, 2024, Doug Ford is still not sold on these safe consumption sites after like 20, 30 years of damn data, he what, do, what, do you, what do you need to be sold? It's simple. They, they, it's, he sees it as a debt and a cost, and they cannot profit from it, and none of his buddies own these places. So there's no way he's ever going to support it. Which is pretty pathetic when you consider he was once a hash dealer. And his brother. Had a crack addiction. Now, of course, his brother had enough money to be able to fly himself to whatever rehab center in the U.S. that he would like on demand. Mm -hmm. Not something that, that's accessible to the average person, and even less the average addict. I mean, come on, man. Here's something. Uh, I'm gonna Why this, make this decision? I'm going to put this on the screen because this is a different approach. That uh, Have a look at this. Have a look at this. I'll read it. This is from our friend Dean. Hey, Ford Nation, I'm appealing to your sense of human decency. I know you care and have empathy for the addicted. I'd rather work with you than mock your deadly decision to shutter safe consumption for our most marginalized. Read this. I'll reach out to you through intermer intermediaries this week. And then the tweet below that is from Guy... Mm. Felicella. Yes, well, we also need to get on the show. Yes. Uh, I wouldn't be here without supervised consumption services. Neither would my kids. Right. Many future families like mine won't become a reality because of the Ontario government, Sylvia Jones, Ford Nation announcement today to close 10 out of 17 supervised consumption sites. Apparently he did it for the children. Doesn't look like it from where I'm standing. Oh my God. And then guys tweet from 2020. Not bad for a guy who had to be brought back, guy, and he put in quotes, <laughs> not bad for yes. a guy who had to be brought back to life six times and struggled with homelessness and addiction for decades in cities, in downtown, in the downtown east side, sorry. I wouldn't be alive today without harm reduction, and I wouldn't have the life I have today without my recovery. First party of five family photo, we do recover. That's from four years ago. That's guy with his wife and his three kids. So productive, putting, contributing, happy member of society who's also people. paying it forward. Exactly. You don't give up on people. As a government, you do not give up on your people. I do not know why this is a concept that is difficult for conservative, ideologically conservative parties to understand. You don't give up on people. Uh, if there's no profit. <sighs> I'm just... I, I'm so tired of people... I Listen, I understand that all the tax dollars in the coffers are not my tax dollars that I contribute. Mm -hmm. I get that. But I am so tired of my share of the tax dollars being used to send the message to certain people that your life is worth less or worthless but worth less, mm -hmm. two words, than that of others. We're hoping for some compassion from Doug Ford on this. And the way Dean is reaching out to him is, um, I think, a, a great... That's not aggressive, so... No, it's, I think it's a good way, way to do it. Yeah, yeah. He's like, let's, let's, let's find some common ground, some compassion and empathy for one another here and work together to make a better place. Because what's about to happen isn't good no no and listen it's not going to take very long after march 31st but no. hey he will have another mandate by then that's his hope right people won't have a chance to see the impacts of that decision before they go vote 
Yeah. I, people are not disposable. And the whole thing, I'm doing this for the children. You've got, after what we talked about last week, you have got to fucking be kidding me. Using children as the shield when you won't fund services for special needs education in schools, when you will not fund services for autistic kids, when we have, again, children in the care of children's aid societies from parents who are surrendering them because they can't meet the needs of their high needs kids and you don't have the licensed foster homes and some of them are staying in Airbnbs and infested bed bug infested hotel rooms mm -hmm. and even in the offices of children's aid societies who you're cutting staff on. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and just <sighs> really for the for the kids for the kids now you care about kids really yeah i for the kids who have no future because their parents are dead for the kids, families are going to go through devastation. Yeah. What if that picture we saw of Guy Felicella, right? What if that was a, rather than an after recovery from addiction, it was before falling into addiction picture. And then one of those six times he overdosed, there was nobody there. Exactly. What's that family photo look like now with four? What happens to the wife? Well, does she start drinking to cope with the pain? Who knows? Who knows? And and, and I mean, what happens she, to the kids who suddenly don't have dad anymore? What happens if mom does start drinking? Then what happens to the kids? It just ends up costing us a lot more money in the long term, right? It it costs us a lot more money in the long term. Like I I don't I don't understand this inability to sit in a room and game this out. Do a tabletop exercise. Yes. If we do this, what are all the things, good and bad, that can happen? You're going to see very clearly that you're going to need the harm reduction. Mm -hmm. There is, there's not going to be less harm from you removing this service than there would be than if you maintained it. Even if you decided to just maintain what was there and not build anymore, and you really should build anymore, but let's just say, The seven that have to close, why, are, why can't the seven who have to close move into a hard hub where that service would be available? You can design a hard hub and make sure that it has the security around it that is needed and guarantee that they're more than 200 meters away from a daycare and whatnot and not license any new daycares to open while that thing is there. So then all of a sudden, oh my God, now it's close to 200 meters. We have to move them again. Well, this one here is good from Saucy Sea Witch. For the kids, is he going to provide a lunch program? Oh no, he had to wait for Trudeau to do that for him too. And, oh, he's, and what else? Daycare, $10 daycare. a day daycare. Yep. He's not making that happen. He's behind on that too. Like of all the things this man can use as a justification for the kids cannot be this is not credible no, it's not. from this man no it's not doug ford hates your children well i mean it's pretty clear what's going on with cas amongst others you had a program about this we talked about it on our show you were on the o show talking about this for the kids eh? for mm. the kids sure for your re-election bid that's all it is. Nothing for your more. Bid. Nothing more. I, give they me a are ex addicts are expendable if it gets you another term both for the federal election. Because what you fear most, Doug Ford, is the fact that Pierre Polyolf would get in because you know Ontarians very rarely keep the same label of government 
provincially as mm -hmm. they do federally. And if Pierre wins federally, that increases your chances. If the provincial election is after the next federal election, as it should be, if everybody was following the four-year thing, that your chances of getting reelected go down substantially. And you're not willing to risk that. So you want to go early at great expense and great unnecessary cost to all of us. And now you have decided that addicts are your scapegoat. Of course they are. Because who cares about them, right? First attack the people that don't matter, right? Which is why Danny's going after trans kids and so are Blaine's. So is Blaine and Scott. Because who cares yeah. about trans kids, right? They're only like 1% of the population or 0.4 or our hour. Who so let's, you know, let's scapegoat the, the smallest percentage of population that won't, can't fight back because nobody has anybody to fight back for them. Right. Yeah, because who's speaking for the addicts, right? Yeah. And I mean, it's not like an addict in the throes of their addiction is the best advocate for themselves, right? Or the most appealing spokesperson if they were to be on the news, right? Right, Doug? But you got your fancy suit and your veneers and your makeup artist and your hairstylist. So when you go in front of your mic to say you're doing this for the kids, well, there's a difference in look, right? Mm -hmm. You're presenting a face that's more likely to have people say, hey, let's we listen to what this guy has to say than an addict would. Right, Doug? That's what you're banking on, right, Doug? I'm not impressed. When we throw people away, I'm not impressed when we warehouse our seniors. I'm not impressed when we warehouse our children. And in all of this, you have your MP, Michelle Ferreri, claiming that there are people that are trafficking their own children. But your priority for the children is increasing the likelihood that addicts will die alone in an alley or a park. Or behind a dumpster of a restaurant. Like, you would think at... Yeah, well, it's like if you're going to cut out the safe consumption sites, then why not at least give them a safe supply then? I, but I'm you're not going to give them a safe supply either. I got to step away for a minute. I'm going to grab a cup of coffee. And there's a couple of things I want to discuss when I get back um, about a larger picture here that I'm seeing across the country from doing a fair bit of traveling across the country lately. I'll address it in just a couple of minutes. I desperately need a coffee and. Uh, I also have to um, get rid of one. Ah. I'll be right back. Coffee, you only rent it. Actually, coffee, you only filter it. No, beer, you filter. Coffee, you rent. Anyway. <laughs> so while um, Paul does this, I'm going to make a little shift um, and uh, talk about uh, the rail strike since we started uh, touching on that a little bit. Uh, CN Rail and uh, CPKS. You know, CPKC, sorry, and their union have until just after midnight tonight to reach a deal. Uh, after this, uh, that uh, if no deal is reached, an unprecedented rail stoppage that is looming uh, will cause uh, is already causing some companies to ship their goods by trucks, uh, but there's a limit to what trucks can do. Quote, already we've had to move a lot of product that was going to be moved on rail to truck right away, says Sam Woods, the president of Joy Logistics, which is a Calgary-based customs broker and freight forwarder. Uh, he says most concerned, he's most concerned about ocean containers, which typically travel to and from port by rail. Uh, if the strike just if the strike does happen, then we'll just be forced to shift everything to truck, which will be a mad dash to get everything on trucks. Stephen Lukowski, who's with the Canadian Trucking Alliance, says that for months now companies have been making similar plans, and uh, they've been making these plans since February and March. And I found that that news was really interesting because we're August now, and it seems that those that had their ear to the ground already had a feeling in February and March that come now, four or five months later, that there would still not be an agreement. I'm not sure 
how they would have got that feeling if they had not been talking to people on the inside that were giving the clear impression that the, they had no interest in reaching a deal by the deadline if they have been making these preparations since February, March. Now it could be that this is just constant contingency planning. Could be. Uh, but it seems that for them, the writing was on the wall back then that what's happening now was going to happen. Um, John Corey with the Freight Management Association of Canada says that certain products can't practically be moved long distances by truck. He says, for example, quote, petroleum, agriculture, mining, potash, coal, there's no real alternative, plus that there's just not enough truck drivers to fill the big gap in transportation. Quote, I hope that people can find an alternative, but trucking is not going to be it. Um, this particular situation as well is um, been exacerbated by how it is that companies have uh, gone about doing what it is that they have done here in their negotiations. Um, and things that have, uh, a couple of things that have happened before. Um, normally, I saw this in a CBC article. Normally, um, these deals are for CN and CP happen in different years. Mm -hmm. So, but in 2002, uh, there was something that was going on at CN with regard to negotiations or contracts that asked that had them ask for about a year extension. So here, according to the CBC. Contract talks between the Teamsters Union and the companies usually take place a year apart. But in 2022, after the federal government introduced new rules on fatigue, CN requested a year-long extension to its existing deal rather than a ne negotiate a new one. They were granted that. This means both companies' labor agreements expired at the end of 2023. And that talks have been ongoing since. As a result, for the first time ever in the history of Canada, the failure of negotiations would halt the vast majority of the Canadian freight rail system at the same time. So these contract negotiations were set up so that they would happen in off years. So in case there was a strike with one, well then, right, you could divert to the other one. But since they mm -hmm. asked for that extension in 2022, all of a sudden you've got companies going on strike at the same time. And there's this gentleman named Larry Hubich, who, uh, at Hubich. L Hubich, yeah, H-U-B-I-C-H, Hubich no, no. or Hubich, uh, who had an like interesting, Hubich. yeah. <laughs> Took him in. Oh, you call him. Yes. Oh, bitch. Wow. Um, had, I'm not had making fun of his name. I just thought it. No, 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 no. no. That's, it's plan words, puns. Yeah, plan words. Um, had an interesting point to make. To assist everybody to start connecting the dots with the recent bargaining dispute between the railways and their employees, unions consider this. For the first time in history, a bargaining impasse between both C and railway unions and CP and the railway unions has occurred simultaneously. I'm pretty certain that is not a mere coincidence. I'm also pretty certain that the simultaneous impasse was not orchestrated by the unions. Why do I say that? Because the union, TR, TCRC, has served mandatory 72-hour strike notice to, co to only one company, CPKC. In response, CPKC's competitor, CN, has served a lockout mm. notice. That tells me that the union was prepared to impact only one railway at a time with the dispute by staggering any job action, but the employers are in cahoots. The reason, because employer groups like the FTCO, look them up, have got heartburn over the fact that the Supreme Court of Canada ruled the right to strike is constitutionally protected in SFL versus Saskatchewan. They don't like it. Employer groups associations hate that workers have constitutionally protected rights and they want that stopped. They are prepared to create economic and political chaos so they don't have to bargain fairly with workers. They want the government to do the dirty work. You pay. That is why CN is locking out because if they can both the service can stop completely then there's more pressure on the government to interact 
to force a solution, which means that the companies save on worker salary and benefits because they don't have to give away as much. Funny how that all works, huh? This is a setup. Of course it is. We're being set up. And while we can say whatever we want about CPKS, right, that they didn't get to CPKC. a deal or whatnot. CPKC, sorry. And why do I keep on saying CS? I don't yeah. know why. Um, Sounds like a radio station. CPK. I know, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> You're listening to CP, CPKS, CPP. <laughs> so, um, there's, new, there's a new, um, new station coming out. Uh, it's radio, radio, C U N T, radio country. Oh, ouch. <laughs> so, I didn't say anything. I know you did. I know you didn't. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, this is really a situation where th there is no need whatsoever in any way, shape, or form for a CN to choose to lock out at this specific time. Other than wanting to create a situation where all service stops. Yes. And the only strategic reason that that could be is to put additional pressure on the government because they will be getting calls from farmers and business people and people at ports going, hey, we're all suffering. The purpose of the strike is to be able to create some pressure on the employer mm -hmm. to get the people from the Canadian public whose lives are being disruptive to say to the employer, hey, get back to the table and negotiate fairly. But the employer now has manufactured, one of them has manufactured a situation where all freight service stops so that more people suffer collateral damage and more people put pressure on the government to stop it, to interfere with workers' rights, which makes it so that the corporations have to pay less. And Cassie like, and the farmers again get caught in the middle. Mm. Yep. Yeah. And I bet you CN is not contacting farmers proactively and offering to compensate them for the damage they are causing by unilaterally choosing to engage in a lockout right now. To have time at their lockout, coincidentally, to coincide with the end of a 72-hour strike notice mm -hmm. from their competitor. We're being set up. Course. Corporate greed, corporate greed, and meanwhile, um, you have uh, Mr. Singh uh, all over uh, the press uh, once again, um, parroting PP. Parroting, well, not parroting PP. Well, parroting PP per perhaps, but also like demanding that the federal government is like the federal government. You better not take any action whatsoever to force these people back to work when the federal government has made no indication whatsoever. When Stephen McKinnon took over from Shima Saregan, said, uh, no, it's probably going to be business as usual. And the business as usual for this government is to let the settlement, settle negotiation. So Jagmeet Singh had a couple of opportunities to go in front of the media and use his time. And instead of using his time to denounce the corporate greed of CN for creating the situation or to deliver a warning to the members of the Conservative Party of Canada, Conservative Party of Canada, Canadian Federation of Interna you know, International Business, all these organizations that usually call for you know, back-to-work legislation before a strike even starts. We're watching you. Don't do that. In most of Canada, west of Ontario, the battle is in between the Conservatives and the New Democrats. Mm -hmm. The farmers, a lot of them, are west of Ontario. Why is Jagmeet Singh not in front of the camera saying, conservatives, you had better not be interfering with this because there are workers here, and you had been better back our calls for compensation for farmers if this goes on too long. Instead, he's in front of the camera going, liberals don't, when liberals have no intention. 
liberals, you better do the thing that you already promised before I came along you were going to do or else. Mm -hmm. Why is his warning for the people who are, <laughs> why is his warning for the people who signed the anti-scap legislation, who brought it in? Why is his warning for the, the, of all the players in this, the one that has shown they're willing to let things play out? Why is his warning not for those who will be making calls for workers' rights to be curtailed? Why is his, call, his warning not for those who would not support a claim for compensation for those who suffer collateral damage as a result of this? Why is Jagmeet Singh, who certainly has a lot to say about corporate greed, not using the power of his pulpit to turn the Canadian attention to what CN is doing. Again, totally bypassing the opportunity in order to do his liberal Tory same old story thing and bash his supply and confidence. This guy is such a fair weather partner. Such a fair weather partner. Just Ugh, this man frustrates me. So again, he has a whole lane to himself that he can just run in because the federal government will probably take a position. Well, you know, we're not going to interfere like this, but not apply much pressure and all that kind of stuff. Just let it play out. He has a whole lane he can run with. Mm -hmm. But instead, no, let's stack the liberals. Let's attack the one entity in all of this based on recent past behavior, shown that they're of the best faith. And let's do the action for action's sake thing. I call on you to do the thing that you've already said last week or when you took over mm -hmm. from Seamus or Regan a couple of weeks ago, you were already going to do. Yeah. I'm calling on you. Waste of bandwidth. Waste of bandwidth. Waste of an opportunity. Waste... <sighs> NDP voters, members of the NDP caucus, your leader's incompetent. <laughs> I like him, but man, he just... <sighs> My God, your leader's incompetent. Wishy-washy. Ugh, jeez. <sighs> Exhausts me. All right. Um, Mr. Grizzly, I have a, a timestamp for you. And this is something I mentioned yesterday. Um, and uh, the timestamp, uh, actually, you know, I will send it to you in the chat to help you find it. Um, there you go. Um, yesterday, I talked a, a little bit about uh, the Democratic National Convention. Um, finished watching what was going on uh, on day one. I know that uh, yesterday, uh, former First Lady Michelle Obama spoke. And, uh, you know, by all reports, again, it's great because she does what she does and she's excellent at it and then uh former president barack obama also spoke and of course you know one of the better orators of recent history when it comes to politics so of course everything he said was great i haven't had a chance to watch them then so mm -hmm. i can only go from the buzz um but i did finish watching uh first night and um i cannot help but be struck by the difference in tone between the two conventions, the difference in star power, um, and the depth of each party's bench. Um, America seems to love their gerontocracy. gerontocracy. I can't pronounce that word right. <laughs> Ger geriatric. Is that what you're trying to use? It's, it's like a mix of Geriatric and democracy, gerontocracy, yeah. or gerontocracy, or gerontocracy. Yeah. The, the words I, I know what you're trying to say. It's a yeah. portmanteau, and it's not an easy one to pronounce. It's my, um, it's my French thing. It happens to me also when I say no, but I'm, I'm, I, I don't have the French thing, and I'm having a difficult time. Yeah. With it, so don't sweat it. So, but there are certain words where I put the emphasis on the wrong syllable. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> um, they have the oldest representatives, like of, other, of any nation, and, and mm -hmm. by far. So with Joe Biden stepping aside, Nancy Pelosi stepping aside, 
that type of stuff. Even in the States, Mitch McConnell looking like he's going to be stepping aside. There really is a passing of the torch here. And then all of a sudden, it's like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez who delivered a really barn burner of an address. AOC, yeah, you know me. Yep. Like this. All of a sudden, she's being seen in another... You know when Barack Obama made that speech when he says, you know, I was a funny guy with big ears who made a, speech, and a funny name, who made a speech, and then all of a sudden, who is this guy? Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, even though people knew AOC, clearly, it's like, whoa, she's got... Wait a minute. She always has. The, the, the energy for... Yes, but the tone and the shift and whatnot, right? Because AOC was known as being more left as part of the squad like this, but she is the one that has out of the four who has shown that she can be a conduit from both sides. Mm -hmm. Like Mm -hmm. she wasn't convinced about Joe at the beginning Mm because, but he won her over like this. And she was one of her big, his biggest champions to stay. Right. Right. Yes. And it's like, and the transition has moved like this and she's moving like this. She's showing that she's a really good team player. Like this, she's fighting for her stuff, but she's not so intransigent and, and unreasonable that she's not willing to put a little water in her wine like this and take a step. So she came across really well. Jasmine Crockett came across freaking amazing. They had the head of the UAW. Mm-hmm. They had uh, the coach that I mentioned to you, uh, the NBA coach, Steve Kerr, who coached uh, one of the basketball teams that uh, won the gold medal at the Olympics, who had something to see on leadership uh, that I found really great. And that's the clip that I've uh, presented from Mr. Gri- Mr. Grizzly. Um, you had Hillary Clinton, who uh, showed that she still has it. And uh, I watched, finally, uh, Joe Biden. Uh, when he t- There was Jill Biden as well. Uh, but Joe Biden, when he came up, and, and Jamie Raskin. And, but you're looking at it, it's like the future is bright in this party as well. Mm-hmm. I guess the stalwarts are still there and are still kicking and they still got it. Joe Biden's speech at the end was good. Absolutely good. Yes. You can, t- you can see the difference in tone and approach from Biden to Harris. Harris is way more joyful, joyful. Same policy positions, but they're presented and packaged differently. Right? Um, so, you know, with Biden, it's a little more dark. Well, let's get to it. Right. But this about leadership. Politics these days comes with risks. I can see the shut up and whistle tweets being fired off as we speak. But I also knew as soon as I was asked that it was too important as an American citizen not to speak up in an election of this magnitude. The reason I said yes to speaking here tonight is that as a coach, and former player, as a husband, a son, a father, even a grandfather, and as an American, I believe in a certain kind of leadership. I believe that leaders must display dignity. I believe that leaders must tell the truth. I believe that leaders should be able to laugh at themselves. I believe leaders must care for and love the people they are leading. I believe leaders must possess knowledge and expertise, but with the full awareness that none of us has all the answers. And in fact, some of the best answers often come from members of the team. And if you look for those qualities in your friends or your boss or an employee or your child's teacher or your mayor, then shouldn't you want those same qualities in your president? There you go. About a minute, but isn't that what it is? Isn't Mm -hmm. that what it's about? Now compare our options. Provincially, where you live, federally. Which of the candidates exhibits these qualities? And which doesn't? Yep. Pretty, pretty, pretty simple and straightforward, I think. Sometimes it's not the big name politician that you need to hear from. You're sitting there like this, hey, I'm a coach. I hear this, shut up and whistle. Shut up and Mm -hmm. sing. Shut up and dribble. 
Artists, stick to singing. That's what you know. Athletes, stick to dribbling. That's what you know. Or what was my favorite? What do you know about politics? For the chicks back in the day? Shut up and Shut sing. Up and sing. How, 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 do you, how do you do that? Yeah, really. So here, here's the mic drop of the night. Now, un- unfortunately, we know what comes next. We know folks are going to do everything they can to distort her truth. My husband and I sadly know a little something about this. For years, Donald Trump did everything in his power to try to make people fear us. See, his his limited, narrow view of the world made him feel threatened by the existence of two hardworking, highly educated, successful people who happen to be black. the job he's currently seeking might just be one of those black jobs. <laughs> Raise the roof on that one. Uh, so that I'm was the mic drop of the night. Because I'm petty. I'm dancing to this because I'm petty. <laughs> well, you remember, remember uh, years ago when, when her famous speech was, when they go low, we go high? Mm-hmm. 2024. And mine was when they Fuck go low. that. And mine was when they go low, we get high. <laughs> but now it's when they go low, kick them in the teeth. Yeah, basically. If they're down there, give them a kick. <laughs> they're the ones who chose to go down there. Mm. Now, um, there is one more thing uh, I would like to show from night one, because I touched about it a little bit uh, on abortion. Um, if you go to uh, 42222, the first one. Um, now, for those who didn't watch this, um, this is going to be hard to hear. Oh, yes. I know. I've seen this clip. It's it's difficult to watch. It's difficult to hear. You, we are giving you the trigger warning right now. So you need prepared. to hear it. Okay. So on the first night, you saw the backgrounds, right? They have the flags and the music and whatnot. And then something happened like this where there was a change in tone. Mm-hmm. And all the red, white, and blue disappeared. The monitors behind turned black. And literally some white words in right, white appeared. Our fight for reproductive freedom and they had three people uh, providing some testimony to the audience there about how uh, the recent changes to abortion laws since uh, the Supreme Court of Canada Supreme Court of Canada Supreme Court of the United US. States um, grabbed the founding fathers by the Kit Kat and decided that over half percent of the pop half 50 percent of the population um, didn't need certain rights anymore. Um, just I just want it to, to play out because um, the way that they did this is um, really good. The perspectives that they brought was really good, um, but it is going to be very hard to hear. But you need to listen to this because the conservative movement is global. Yes. They all sing from the same playbook and they all have the same goals. So what has happened there is planned for here if we can manage to get it. And these are the potential consequences. This is why we need, when I say democracy, something that you do, that we need to put our bodies in the game and make sure that the pencil-necked little dweeb who wants so desperately to be Prime Minister of Canada cannot possibly be the one even if you want change right now again ask change to what and it cannot be changed to that well remember he's got members backbenchers of his caucus that literally have brought forth what 30 or 40 times what they're trying to 
give rights for the uh, protect the unborn or the preborn. Okay. Sorry, the pre preborn. Uh, yes. So again, it's going to be tough, but please do listen. When you're expecting a baby, packing for the hospital should be a joyful moment. For us, it was different. We were told with 100% certainty we would lose our baby girl, Willow, and we were sent home. For three days, we waited until Amanda was sick enough to receive standard abortion care. Eventually, Amanda's temperature spiked. She was shaking, disoriented, and crashing. I don't remember what I threw into our bag that day, only that instead of welcoming Willow, I was hoping Amanda's life could be saved. I'm here tonight because the fight for reproductive rights isn't just a woman's fight. This is about fighting. This is about fighting for our families. And as Kamala Harris says, our future. Every time I share our story, my heart breaks. For the baby girl we wanted desperately, for the doctors and nurses who couldn't help me deliver her safely. For Josh, who feared he would lose me, too. But I was lucky. I lived. So I'll continue sharing our story, standing with women and families across the country. Today, because of Donald Trump, more than one in three women of reproductive age in America lives under an abortion ban. A second Trump term would rip away even more of our rights. Passing a national abortion ban, letting states monitor pregnancies and prosecute doctors, restricting birth control and fertility treatments. We cannot let that happen. We need to vote as if lives depend on it, because they do. Two years ago, my husband and I were expecting our second child. Our daughter, Lauren, couldn't wait to be a big sister. I was getting ready for her fourth birthday party when something didn't feel right. Two emergency rooms sent me away. Because of Louisiana's abortion ban, no one would confirm that I was miscarrying. I was in pain, bleeding so much my husband feared for my life. No woman should experience what I endured, but too many have. They write to me saying, what happened to you happened to me. Sometimes they're miscarrying, scared to tell anyone, even their doctors. Our daughters deserve better. America deserves better. <laughs> Kamala Harris and Tim Waltz will fight for reproductive rights and our freedom and our shared future. Growing up, I was an all-American girl. Varsity soccer captain, cheerleading captain. I, I just want to pause before this yes. goes because there's a big trigger warning here. Yes. This is the most difficult one to watch. What you've heard yes. is tough. What you're about to hear is going to punch you in the gut. So if you cannot handle certain things when it comes to SA, you might now want you to fast forward Okay, this is the this is your, this is your trigger warning. This is difficult to watch. So be forewarned. Okay, here we go. Captain, homecoming queen, 
and Survivor. I was raped by my stepfather after years of sexual abuse. At age 12, I took my first pregnancy test, and it was positive. That was the first time I was ever told, you have options. I can't imagine not having a choice. But today, that's the reality for many women and girls across the country because of Donald Trump's abortion bans. He calls it a beautiful thing. What is so beautiful about a child having to carry her parents' child? <laughs> there are other survivors out there who have no options. And I want you to know that we see you. We hear you. She will fight for every woman and every girl, even those who are not fighting for her. And now, I am honored to introduce another champion for women, a leader who's fought for me and for so many others, Governor Andy Bashir. Okay. So yeah. A beautiful day. Yeah, that's um Cut punch. I again, it's not the big stars. Sometimes you got to listen to. I know entirely too many women who have been where that young woman was. I know too many of them. I know so many of them that have been in her position. And the fact that somebody wants to take their reproductive rights away because they, well, it's still a beautiful child. She was raped by a relative. She's a beautiful child. As a child, she was raped. As a 12 year old, she is a beautiful child too, right? Right? Or is she not? Yeah, I know too many people, too many women. One is, one is too many. And I know, I know several who've been through that. Okay, we, I gotta, we gotta, we gotta change, we gotta change it up. It's too heavy for me right now. I'm, I'm sorry. One of the reasons, also, I wanted to mention that is because the gentleman who started that saying it's not only a woman's issue. No, it's not. It's not. There's a great article. I included a link in the chat for the kids from the Guardian. Guys go where their buddies are. The young men recruiting each other to fight for abortion rights. Oh no, no! I think you're trying to get in contact with my wife. That's what a man in Florida recently told an activist who knocked on his door to talk about abortion rights. But the man was wrong. The activist who represented a group called Men for Choice was there to talk to him because the group is dedicated to getting more men who support abortion rights involved in the fight for them. They have to get off the sidelines, said Dwayne Martin, the youth organizing director of Men for Choice, who relayed the act activist's account to The Guardian. They have to become the foot soldiers of this movement. Two years after the U.S. Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade and allowed more than a dozen states to ban almost all abortions, most men in the United States support abortion rights. Within months of the decision, 65% of men between the ages of 18 and 29 said they supported abortion being legal in all or more cases. Again, the kids are all right. Yeah. The youth are all right. But Men for Choice calls these young men passively pro-choice. Young men, women still support abortion rights at higher rates than their male peers, 
and young men are just as not just not as motivated to take a public stance on the issue. Just 43% of Gen Z men said that abortion rights are, quote, a critical issue compared with 68% of Gen Z women. The political scientist Melissa Deckman found in her forthcoming book, The Politics of Gen Z. This indifference has consequences. Compared with women, men between the ages of 18 and 44 are less likely to say that abortion is motivating them to vote in 2024 elections, according to the polling firm Perry Undum. They are also less likely to say that the state of abortion rights will affect for whom they vote. Men for Choice's goal is to get these young men to vote, canvass, and otherwise act on their beliefs instead of leaving the work to women. Quote, when we think about our organizing strategy, it's help men see the harm, said Oren Jacobson, Men for Choice co-founder. Help men understand how this issue is not just a women's issue. It's not just about abortion. It's about freedom. It's about power. It's about control. It's an issue that impacts all of us, our families, our loved ones. It affects young men's futures too. Compared with young men whose partners get pregnant and give birth, young men whose partners had abortions are almost four times more likely to graduate college. Young men who have been involved in abortion are also most likely to make more money than those whose partners gave birth. Overall, an estimated one in five men has impregnated somebody who has had an abortion. Democrats have made abortion rights one of their central issues in the 2024 elections. Uh, uh, However, as the and Republicans uh, are, are trying to back away from their decision, to what they've done there. But however, as they've backed away, right-wing commentators and politicians have become far more adept at disgusting masculinity than their left-wing counterparts. These right-wing public figures are not only willing to acknowledge that young men are struggling with getting into college, with their finances, with their mental health, but also to portray these struggles as a result of women's growing social and political power. This kind of talk, which is so popular, It has essentially spawned a cottage industry is believed to be a major reason why despite their past support for liberal causes so many young men are now pivoting towards conservatism it feels good it's telling men you're the priority you're the superior being said devante jennings a men for choice fellow who lives in georgia you act like this this is when you get all the cars the women the mansion grinder 20 grind 24 7 not grinder sorry (laughs) don't think about mental health depression isn't real this is the message that they're trying to send men yeah. The Andrew Tates of the world. Oh, by the way, his house just got raided again. Oh, good. I mean, oh, darn. Oh, what a shame. Isn't that terrible? Yeah, such toxic masculinity is part of the reason why young men don't feel like they can be openly passionate about abortion rights. He hears references to it all the time when Jennings talks to men through Men for Choice. The men often use phrases like, to be a man and the manly thing to do. Expressing emotions, including caring about abortion rights, doesn't fit into that mold of masculinity. So uh, what this boils down to, what this boils down to is when it comes to democracy, voting in right-wing conservatives will do damage to your mental health, your physical health, will control your rights and take many of them away from you. And it will also crash your economy. You don't believe me? Well, here, here's one for you. I'm our friend, James Christian Parson, Dred Tory. Things sure have been going swimmingly in New Zealand since they elected a government of right-wing meatheads last year and got rid of that woke lib witch, Ardern. Yes, sirree. Sydney, March 15th, from Reuters. New Zealand will report significantly slower economic growth for the next few years when it releases a pre-budget update in two weeks' time. Finance Minister Nicola Witness said on Friday, as slower productivity growth hampers hampers the country's economy. Sorry, I just got to clear my throat. Terribly sorry about that. New Zealand's economy unexpectedly contracted in the third quarter and a significant downward revisions were made to economic growth in earlier quarters, leading the market to pull back on bets of further interest rate hikes, hikes next year. That combined with combined with recent data continuing to be weaker than forecast has led Treasury officials to re, reassess growth projections for the economy, Willis said. The numbers haven't been finalized, but I know enough to say they won't make happy reading. It's been obvious for months that the New Zealand economy was falling apart. Six consecutive quarters of per capita recession do not lie. Leading soft data is even worse. New Zealand population growth slows further on economic weakness. Quarterly population gain posted is the slowest in two years. 
RBNZ began easing policy last week as price pressures abate. New Zealand, emigration soars amid economic woes. Population growth in New Zealand has almost stagnated owing to high emigration rates, new statistics show. Neighboring Australia is a popular destination for many leaving the country. What does it all mean? Elect the con government? Get punished for it. Period. Wow. Period. Wow. Gee, I, I had no idea that had happened in New Zealand. Yeah, well, here's your, I got another screenshot for you. Because <sighs> trust the National Post to propose that a catastrophically inept crew of right-wing oh. poltrons carries good tidings. Jeez. Jamie Sarkonak, conservative victory in New Zealand, a good sign for Polly F's Tories. When an Anglo country with a self-strangling climate policy and a strong identity-based guilt reflex turns blue, we should take note. Published November 6, 2023. <sighs> yeah. Jeez. Elect a conservative government, and this is what will happen. Your economy will stagnate. The rich will get richer. The poor will get much poorer. Your rights will be robbed and stripped away from you. Your health care budget will be cut like it has in Ontario. Your education uh, budget will be cut like it has in Ontario and Alberta, for that matter. And look at what these cons are doing to uh, the people who have no, neither the means nor the voice to speak up for themselves. I'm telling you. If you elect a conservative government, you are not electing progressives because there is no progressive conservatives anymore in this country, in party. There are many people that are. There certainly are. And there's long-standing people who still say, I'm a progressive conservative. But they don't have a party anymore that represents them, at least in the East. In the West, in Manitoba, you have Wab Canoe for the provincial NDP government, which is more like a Joe Clark Tory progressive conservative. Their policies have shown this. His actions have shown this. What he's doing has shown this to be true. So get out and vote in the next election, whenever it comes along, wherever you live, whether it's provincial, municipal, or federal, Make your vote count and make sure it doesn't harm the most vulnerable people in your community because I guarantee you the Conservative Party will harm those people as evidenced by the rhetoric we've been hearing from Pierre Polyev for the last two years. Yep. And with that, we got to wrap it up, sir. All right. I've got one final detail before we go. Uh, economically, uh, numbers that we had been waiting for yesterday uh, with uh, regard to inflation because everybody's wondering about uh, future interest rate uh, cuts from the Bank of Canada. Well, our latest inflation numbers came out and in news that uh, is great for Canada and Canadians, which means that PP Vance will have a yet another joyless day trashing everything Canada, is that our inflation rate has dropped to 2%. 0.5%, its lowest in about three and a half years, I think, since March of 2021. Food inflation is below that, so food inflation is lower than regular inflation at 2.1%, while wage growth, based on our most recent uh, labor force survey, is still above at 5.2%. So now it's been well over a year now, perhaps even close to a year and a half now, that uh, wage growth is uh, happening at a rate that's faster than inflation. So a lot of the ground that we lost on inflation had hit 8.1. Uh, a lot of people are getting some of that back now. Um, so that's helpful. It's, it's not enough to cover the gap that has opened up since then, but a lot of people are getting to breathe a little easier with, uh, with their wage growth. Um, now this was led by a half point, so 0 0.5 decrease in shelter inflation, and that's as a result of interest rates being cut. The first two uh, cuts uh, in interest rate from the Bank of Canada have gone down, have trickled down to mortgages, have trickled down. Uh, so uh, there are other news reports that I don't have here, and we're going to do this fast. I'm not going to go into them. Uh, that shows that uh, uh, average rents have gone down, average prices of mortgages have gone down, 
home prices have gone down a little bit um, in uh, many places across Canada uh, have started to go down a bit. Um, due to this and because of what's happening in the United States as well, uh, it seems uh, very, very, very likely, uh, very like over 90% chance that the Bank of Canada will be cutting interest rates by 25 basis points, both at their meetings on September 4th and October 23rd, with possibly one more before the end of the year. Uh, so it would bring us to about, uh, I believe uh, we're at 4.5 now, so that would bring us to 3.75 by the end of the year. And uh, as uh, forecasts were before that the, it might not go below 2.75 by the end of the next year, some are actually starting predicting that there's about a 40% chance uh, that it will uh, go to like a little lower, even maybe like 2.67 by the end mm. of next year. Um, so, hey, anything that we can get as an additional bonus in these times uh, would be great. The other thing that's happening, because, of course, Pierre keeps on telling us that uh, everything's broken, uh, and one of the things that he's been telling us is broken is uh, our economy because it hasn't been growing as fast as, you know, we haven't been hitting that 3% growth or whatever, you know, that, that makes conservatives happy. But of course, the whole point of raising the interest rates was to cool growth, which the bank, without going into recession, which the Bank of Canada seemed to do because in uh, the um, second quarter, no, the last quarter, yes, of 2023, so Q4, or the fourth quarter of 2023, GDP was at 0.2%. Mm. So that's pretty much as close to zero as you could get to say, like completely yeah. flat, stagnant, full actual stagnation without going into a recession. And then that went up to 0.6% for the first quarter of 2024. So you hear people going, oh my God, we're not growing like this. Well, for the second quarter, these numbers are not confirmed because they need to be you know, analyzed and whatnot. But the Bank of Canada is predicting 1.5% for the quarter that we just had. 0 0.2, 0 0.6, 1.5. It's kind of looking at that soft landing that they said that they were trying to do an engineer did indeed happen. So when you add that to the fact that we are one of the countries that have recovered quickest from covid mm -hmm. disaster that got the jobs back plus all the jobs back that were lost and then some mm -hmm. from the covid again a lot of us are not feeling it but macroeconomically this particular government is getting the job done and getting the job done very 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 well and if we continue to keep on this uptrend for the full next year by the time the election comes, a lot of PP's everything is broken narrative that he's been running on for the last two years, that context won't be there anymore. If we are below 3%, 2% interest rate, and now at 2.5, inflation is literally in the middle of the target range between 2 and 3. Mm -hmm. Literally in the middle of the target range. How long does he get to run on that? Oh, and housing starts are up as well interest down inflation down housing starts down up sorry rents are decreasing maybe we're on the right path Listen. maybe it's what we were told all along everyone's going through a tough time we need to buck down but it will work and it seems to have started to work now of course Federal government has to not make the same mistake that Christian Freeland made when interest rates started to go down. Not say, we did this. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. No. We did this. All of us. We made the sacrifices. Now all of us are going to start reaping the rewards. You take that tone, you got something. Right? It's all how you package the information. But this is good news. Agreed. It's good news. All right. Mr. Grizzly, do we have a show? We do indeed. All right. And Kids and Cubs, I did see the comments in the chat about uh, 
<laughs> Very nice, thank you. But uh, apparently, when I I give uh, my disappointed face, as I did when we were talking about certain issues, uh, apparently, um, that's my my. Apparently, it's a dad disappointed face. So they're saying that I would be a wonderful dad because me telling my children, you know, no, I'm not mad. I'm just very disappointed in you. Seems so it would be crushing <laughs> with the face that I give. <laughs> They're saying that we maybe need some t-shirts with Mr. Beaver's disappointed in you. <laughs> well, I, 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 I don't think I want my face on any t-shirt that says I'm disappointed with people. <laughs> it might not be great for my brand. Okay. <laughs> as a happy and cheerful person but i understand the sentiment and thank you for the compliments about my ability to be so he said he said he'll be a great father look how he handles all of us it's like, oh, you all know mm. you all know just what to say to make a beaver feel good <laughs> i'm proud of all of you all my kids and cubs you've done such good work today <laughs> all righty you all get an extra cookie <laughs> no no more sugar no more sugar <laughs> no more sugar and do your homework and eat right. your broccoli all right <laughs> and be nice to your mother <laughs> all right <laughs> ah get some good mr grizzly do we have a show yes we do <laughs> all right get some cups <laughs> that's the end of this episode of the daily beaver podcast uh, and the daily beaver morning show we hope that you love listening to us because we love making this for you remember that sharing is caring and word of mouth is priceless so please tell your peeps all about us <laughs> we really appreciate it <laughs> oh, the kids are lovely today um if you would like to make sure that you do not miss an episode and more of them are up, thanks to the hard work of Mr. Grizzly. Thank you so very much. Um, you don't have to, thanks to the Ray Girl who sponsors our pod page. So if you scan the QR code that's about to appear, Mr. Grizzly always makes it happen like magic. Sorry, I'm just typing something. That's quite all right. Or if you use your voice command or the lovely digits on those lovely hands to go to podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver, lowercase letters with the hyphen between each one of those words. If you click subscribe there, there he is. Then when we have something fresh off the bandwidth, it comes directly to you. Kit Jen, thank you both for your kindness and sensitivity it restores my shaken faith in humanity. Thank you, love. We really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, if you would like to support us in other ways, make like Kit Elaine. Have a beyond awesome day, everyone. And surf on down to the True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated YouTube site to smash those buttons before you leave. Like, share, subscribe. When you smash them, it brings us so much joy. We now have memberships where you can join. And there's Ooh. different tiers. Ooh la la. Loyalty, VIP, executive. Yeah, there's there's different tiers as, as uh, Saucy Sea Witch gifted 10 people randomly. So, yeah, uh, different tiers, and we will provide more content for you. We just have to start recording it. <laughs> lavish. <laughs> Enjoy our lavish and swanky memberships. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and if you would like to support us in other ways, well, you can do that through our coffee page. That's coffee, ko-fi.com slash eager beaver lowercase letters all in one word and there's where you will find our tip jar so if you happen to have a little bit jingling in your pockets and you would like to encourage us to do more because you like the quality of information and analysis that we bring you or you just like our sunny disposition any reason's a good reason we would be very 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 grateful if you do so coffee ko hyphen fi.com slash eager beaver lowercase letters find our tip jar leave a little something in there you earn our undying gratitude and your personal magnetism goes up about 17.3%. People will know and say, ooh, that looks like somebody who's super interesting to talk to. Hmm. Maybe I should have a conversation with that person. I could learn something. It happens. You just get this glow. And people can tell. We've tested it in the lab. It's a real thing. Yep. All right. <laughs> because democracy is something that you do. Remember, we have some by-elections coming up, so get involved. 
very important that you do. Thank you so much. And again, if you're in Ontario, uh, I know I mentioned it a lot lately, but it's an issue that is dear to my heart. So please write uh, your MPPs. Uh, and again, if you're not in Ontario, because I'm sure that this is a situation that's happening across Canada and many provinces, um, ask what uh, your elected representatives are doing for kids in care. Indigenous kids in care, non-Indigenous kids in care, what they're doing to make sure that uh, kids don't fall through the cracks of the child welfare system. Would really, really appreciate that. Would mean a lot to me. Thank you so very much. Um, let's see what else. Oh my God, there's so many new names in the chat all of a sudden that I've never these, seen these before. Are, they've been gifted memberships from uh, Saucy Sea Witch. Wow. Well, so when you gift a membership, it just randomly gives it to ten people. So okay, we, but we the, these are all names I do not I do not recognize. Uh, if you've well, received all these memberships, like 50, welcome to all of you. There's yeah, 50, I know. Four hundred subscribers. I know. I know. Welcome to all of you. Welcome to all of you. Uh, make use of the membership. Thank you very much. Um, all right, uh, Mr. Grizzly, do you have some words of wisdom? <sighs> just remember to be kind. Just remember to be kind to everybody you encounter. We're all going through some ter terrible stuff right now. Uh, you know, Mercury in retrograde and whatever have you. But the world is in a serious state and people are feeling it. So just be kind to each other if you can. Mm -hmm. And if yes. you can't be kind, just be quiet. Yes. And uh, Kit Dan uh, also mentioned specifically, right, Minister Michael Parsa, who is the minister uh, family community social services i think is the, the name of the but i'll get uh, the address uh for you to write and that way uh we'll mention that in the easter egg as well okay mr chrisley please um cue the cock you are listening to a true north eager beaver media incorporated podcast the true north eager beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors the Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster. Hot pepper sauce is made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph something for our opening and closing sequence music. All right. Uh, I have it uh, right here, Mr. Grizzly. Uh, if you want to reach... Michael Parsa, who is the Minister of Children, Community, and Social Services of Ontario. Um, the address here is Constituency Office, 13085 Young Street, Suite 201, Richmond Hill, Ontario, L4E3S8. That's 13085 Young Street, Suite 201, Richmond Hill, Ontario, l 4 e 3 S8. Toll free number 888 486 5352. That's 888 486 5352. Telephone number 1905 773 6250. That's 1905 773 6250. And uh, he is the person specifically. And if you want to email, it's michael.parsaco, P-A-R-S-A-C-O, at P-C dot O-L-A, for Ontario Legislative Assembly, dot org, O-R-G. I'll put that uh, one up there visually as well. There you go. Mr. Grizzly has it there in the, in the chat. Uh, there's a, a dot uh, between Michael and Parsaco. Uh, so uh, the... the one that Mr. Grizzly just put up there uh, at a period between Michael and uh, and Parsico uh, to have uh, the, the correct email address. Oh, there. Uh, actually, I'll send it. I'll put it up again. There you go. All right, Mr. Grizzly, uh, for the fun Easter egg, uh, our old pal Jake uh, from the What You Can Do Network is um, covering, of course, 
uh, the DNC convention, the Democratic National Convention, uh, in his always fun way. Um, I believe he's doing some like rather marathon shows, sort of live watching and all that kind of stuff. But uh, he did find time to uh, see what uh, Pierre has been up to here with this video and uh, was able to put together, I don't know when it is, he had time, a new version of it in which he corrected the visuals to make them way more relevant and appropriate, we believe, for uh, what it is that he was trying to communicate. I say that with a big wink. Um, but, kids, I think you might like this. Now, for people who are listening at home, um, it's going to sound exactly like the regular video, and you're not going to see the sight gags, um, unfortunately. So uh, if you're listening uh, at home, you might want to take a stroll on down to the YouTube page and look at today's episode. You just have to like go to the end mm -hmm. to see this part. Unless you want to watch it again from the beginning. I mean, please do. <laughs> but uh, to get what's going on here, you might, you'll might you have to see it. because uh, It's easy to forget what home and hope look like. So let me paint the picture of school children, boys and girls, being welcomed by their teacher at the front of the school as they walk in to learn about reading, writing, arithmetic, and our proud history. Before walking in the door, though, they look back at Dad in his pickup truck, who's dropped them off. He rolls down that suburban street with his windows open in the school zone, driving slowly so that he can hear that beautiful crackling sound of hammers pounding nails into Canadian lumber on newly built and affordable Canadian homes. When he gets to the gas station, he fills his tank with affordable, and lower taxed Canadian made energy. He makes his way out into the countryside where he's going to go and service a well and he looks out his windows and sees those big prestigious barley or canola fields, the combines out there doing their work, the cattle grazing on the countryside producing the best food from the best farmers anywhere on earth and he looks up and what does he see he sees a brand new fighter jet they're doing a training mission in the sky getting ready to defend our home and native land the same plane is soon seen from a university campus where kids are hustling <laughs> off to class maybe a bit late having just procrastinated on that university essay, knowing that when they get to class, they will have the chance to debate freely and fearlessly without worry of being censored. Later in the day, that whole family of the student, that welder, the kids, moms and dads come together for a big family celebration because it's been 10 years since one of the adult kids in the family has been sober and overcome his drug addiction. And they gather around the table to have a big, beautiful dinner to celebrate. Some wonderful venison that was shot with totally legal Canadian firearms. And they sit and they talk about their beautiful past, but even more so about their optimistic future. And as the little ones conk off and it's time to take them home, grandma and grandpa see them off to the car and the car leaves the driveway, and they turn and they look west. And what do they see? They see wheat, foothills, rockies, and a big blue twilight sky. And they look each other in the eye, and they say, we're home. <laughs> These are our people. That is our country. This is our home. Your home. My home. Our home. Let's bring it home. I love Godzilla at the end. It's all so disturbing. All right. Thank you, Jake. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I got to go. Yeah. <laughs>